want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to speak to my life. I ask that you administer to my heart. May your word be revealed to me today in a way that I will be able to receive it, to understand it, so that I can do it and see it change my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask the person as you're sitting down next to you, are you alive? Tell the person next to you, say, no more dead rocks. Amen. Come on, give Jesus one more big shout of praise here this morning. Amen. Amen. And we're starting a new sermon series. It's called Betrayed. And betrayal is something that all of us know. And we like to talk about the times we've been betrayed. We don't talk about the times we've betrayed. And as we start out with this service, I want to ask you, how faithful are you? How faithful are you? If our girlfriends or boyfriends or fiancés or husbands or wives, if they cheat on us, we complain. But how many times do we cheat on them? And Jesus said, listen, let me tell you what the standard is for whether you've cheated on that person. Have you cheated on with them? Have you cheated on them in your mind? Have you fantasized about someone else? Jesus says if you've done that, you've done it. And you need a savior. I want to tell you as you're sitting out today, it is a weak people that does that. It is a weak people that cannot praise God with everything that they've got. It is a weak people that stands in the service while the worship is going on with their lips not moving. It is a weak people when the prayer was going on at the beginning that stands there staring and not even praying. I know some of you were doing that. And you think you're strong, but it's a weak people. And I want you to realize God did not raise up in this nation a weak people. If you look at all of the things that this nation has been through over history, He did not raise up a weak people. A weak people is a people that is easily offended. And people that are easily offended easily become unfaithful. How cross do you get with people? How angry do you get with people? How quickly do you get upset with what you're told? Some of you, I can't believe he called me a dead rock. Did you refuse to shout? Did you refuse to praise God? Rather say, I don't need to shout to not be a dead rock. Come up with something else. But what I want you to realize, often you, t you tell people you were hurt by something someone said to you. But how often do you sit down and look at, is that which they was said to me true or not? Is it true? But you don't concern yourself with it. And then what happens is, if it's not true and you don't concern yourself with it, you end up becoming like Judas, where you give people in your life, maybe even Jesus himself, that faithful kiss. You know, Judas, he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. A sign of friendship, a sign of love, a sign of I'm with you. He betrayed him with a kiss. And we can sit there and we can judge Judas till the cows come home. But how many times have we betrayed people with a kiss? And then you've got the other side of it, where you start saying things behind their back. And you're complaining about what they did. But how, do you, how would you feel if someone is speaking about what you did to them behind your back? Even if you know you were wrong. How many times have I heard people say, why couldn't you say it to me? Now, people sometimes say to me, why couldn't you say that to me? And normally my answer is, I did. You weren't listening. I upset people a lot. Because I tell them what I see, and I look at what I see, and I see the Bible, and I see what the Bible says. And then I tell them, this that you're doing, the Bible says this, bam, they're upset. 
And I want to encourage you in terms of that, in terms of how you rate everything in your life. Start looking at what the Bible says. You'll be shocked at how the Bible judges your thoughts. The Bible judges every thought. And instead of living in fear, everything in the world is about fear. Christians are afraid to speak out about some of the nonsense that has been spoken in society because of fear. Christians do not want to go and tell other people about Jesus because of fear. It could be the fear of being mocked. It could be the fear of being rejected. It could be the fear of all sorts of things. But the opposite of fear is faith. And we spoke last week about incubating your faith, where you envisage a clear-cut objective. Listen, when you fear, you put a very clear picture in your mind of that fear. And you see the disaster that's going to come. And what you need to do with faith is do the opposite and see a clear-cut objective, see the promises of God, and see what God's going to do. Amen? Oh, South Africa's finished. Says who? I'm just look at what's going on. Look at Eskim. Says who? Eskim isn't God. Yeah, but we need electricity. Says who? I, I want you to realize you've got to have a clear-cut picture of the future and then a burning desire to see a change. I want to tell you, South Africans, by and large, do not have a burning desire to see South Africa come right. Many of you, you don't even pray for your nation. You don't even pray for your president because there's no burning desire for it to come out. Now, it's nice to complain about Ramaphosa. It's nice to say what a jerk he is. It's nice to go pala pala him all the way to the bank. At the end of the day, where's your burning desire? Because Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Take delight in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desires. And then you will see God begin to build up something inside of you. And then you pray for the assurance. You pray for the assurance inside your soul that God's going to answer your prayer. And you start speaking the word. You start speaking life over that situation. Today I want to read to you from Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 to 15. And we're talking about faithfulness. We're talking about the faithful kiss. We're talking about what Judas did. And I want to I wanna warn you today. You can judge Judas. But every one of us can go that way. I also want you to notice where Judas ended up. Judas ended up in the place where Satan came in and took control of him. And what happens when Satan takes control of you? You start having seizures. You start foaming at the mouth. And many times you'll kill yourself. Don't look at all the musicians who talk about all of the stuff of getting the devil in and selling my soul for the music and the fame. It's all a load of twack. The devil wants to kill you. And if he controls you, you're going to die soon. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 15 says, and this is Apostle Paul speaking, Dear friends, you have always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining and arguing. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. I want you to think about those words. He says, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And he says, now that I'm away, it's even more important. How many of us can be trusted to do what we're supposed to do? When whoever gave us that responsibility is not there. If you look at Paul, yeah, it's the same problem we have. People only obey when we're there. How many of the people that, was, that were part of the stay away on Monday themselves have the issue 
that they only do what they're supposed to. They only obey what needs to be done. They only obey the boss that's paying them when he's there. Our goal should be to, be, to become people of character. People who have the character of Jesus on the inside of them. People that will do the same thing, whether the boss or the teacher or the parent or whatever authority we might have is there or not. People that will follow the law, whether the police are there or not. And the key that Paul says is, in fact, now that I'm not there, you mustn't do what you did when I was there. You must do more. The key is you must do more. Why must you do more? Because Paul's not there. And because Paul's not there, the work Paul did's not being done. So you need to do even more than you did when Paul was there because you need to cover for what Paul was doing. You see, that's the attitude of someone that has the character of Jesus. When the boss is not there, someone with the character of Jesus does extra to cover for the fact that the boss isn't there. If your mentality is relax, the boss isn't here. Relax, the pastor's not here. Relax, the parents or the teacher aren't here. If that is your attitude, you've missed it. You have totally missed it in terms of life. Because there's a lack of character. There's a total and an utter and a complete lack of character. And, and let me tell you something. South Africa was in trouble long before Ramaphosa became president. South Africa was in trouble long before the ANC came to power. South Africa was in trouble long before the National Party brought in the system of apartheid. South Africa is not in trouble because of politicians. The politicians are a reflection that South Africa is in trouble because we're a people and we lack character. Your measuring stick is not your grandfather or your grandmother. Your measuring stick for character is Jesus. Where do we stack up when we compare ourselves to Jesus? And I want to tell you something today. <clears throat> In life, if you really want to increase your capacity, start raising disciples. Raise disciples that will work even harder when you're not there. Weak people only fix things just before the cat is back. Weak people don't do what they're supposed to. Oh, the boss is coming back. Oh, the boss is, oh, we better fix quickly. Clean up, clean up, clean up, clean up. Let's get everything right. People who do that are weak people. People who do not even care when the boss comes back and they just leave it like that or even weaker. And here's what I want you to realize. And when you look at South Africa, you can see it. But weakness is a curse. Why are so many children broken in their homes? They're broken because they have weak parents. They have weak parents who only do what is right when the cat's there. Why do we struggle so much with the matric marks? Everyone blames the government, but we have weak matrics. They've dropped the standard. The matric standard has dropped in the last 30 years, and yet less people pass. How come more people passed, more black people pass matric in the height of apartheid than what do now? How does that happen? How is it that people that were under oppression passed better than people who are supposed to be, who are supposedly free? Because you're not free. There's a curse. I want you to think about this thing of unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness will cause you to lose all sorts of opportunities. Unfaithfulness causes you to break your word to people that you love, to hurt people that you love by not being there for, being there for them. 
when they need you. Unfaithfulness hurts you when other people betray you. You know, when other people betray you, that betrayal is a curse on you. It's an argument that the devil uses against you that you will never overcome until that curse has been smashed by the blood of Jesus. Your unfaithfulness will never be overcome until your unfaithfulness, where you don't keep your word, is smashed by the blood of Jesus. You cannot make yourself faithful. And so how do you know when you're under a curse? Every time we do an encounter, there's a list that Dr. Derek Prince put together from Deuteronomy chapter 28. So the best way to find out is if, if you're under a curse is not to go to some gorma or someone or go ask someone's opinion. Go to the Bible. And from Deuteronomy chapter 28, we see mental an emotional breakdown, if you're breaking down mentally, if you're breaking down emotionally, you're under a curse. If you find yourself suffering repeated or chronic sicknesses, especially if you've inherited the sickness from your parents or your grandparents, it's a sign that you're under a curse. Women, if you're having female problems, infertility, you can't have children, miscarriages, premature births, menstrual pain, all kinds of Related issues, woman issues, it's a sign of a curse. Breakdown of marriage, family alienation, where the brothers don't speak to each other, where the home is a war zone. If your house is on fire with war, you're fighting with your parents, you're fighting with your brothers and sisters. If you're married, you're fighting with your spouse, it's a sign of a curse. Financial insufficiency, you don't have enough money. Stop blaming other people if you don't have enough money. It's a sign that you're under a curse. The curse needs to be broken. If you're accident prone. Some people every week, they had another accident. It's a sign of a curse. And the last one is a history of suicides or unnatural deaths in your family. If you have a history of suicides or unnatural deaths where you have these tragedies coming up, uh, uh, upon you all the time, you have to get on your knees and you have to start applying the blood of Jesus. And you need to learn how to do that. You need to break that curse. So what curse do you see in your life? What do you struggle with in your character? How firm are you standing in your faith? I want to tell you that in terms of fixing this, it doesn't help to decide I'm going to fix it. You've got to apply the blood of Jesus. And we're coming up now for Easter. Easter is a time we celebrate the fact that Jesus died. And when Jesus died, he shed his blood in seven places to the point that he never... Listen to me. I want you to listen to what I'm telling you now. Not one drop of his blood remained in his body. Jesus shed every drop of his blood for you. Every inch of his life. And so... The first place he shed his blood was when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus knew full well what was going to happen to him. He knew he, he was walking into the Garden of Gethsemane a free man. But he was going to walk out of the garden in chains. He knew Judas was going to betray him. He knew that all of the other 11 disciples were going to run away except Peter who was going to follow at a distance. But he knew that even Peter, who followed at a distance, was going to then say, I don't know him. A little girl would come and ask him, weren't you with Jesus? And he was going to start swearing. The swear words were going to start coming out of his mouth as he cursed. He says, I don't know the man. And he wasn't even going to realize what he was doing until he'd done it three times. Three times people came and said, weren't you with Jesus? And three times he was going to say, 
I don't know the man until the rooster crowed. The sun was coming up and the rooster crowed. cock a doodle do. The moment that sound rang out, he remembered. That was Jesus' most faithful dude. That was the one who was most faithful to him. Cursed three times. He swore and he said he didn't even know him. Jesus knew beforehand this was going to happen. And so he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he starts to pray. But there's such anxiety on him that as he prays, he begins to sweat. And blood begins to come out of him. The blood of faithfulness. In Luke chapter 22 verse 44 it says, This is Jesus. He prayed more fervently. He was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood. Imagine being so anxious, so filled with anxiety. Imagine freaking out to such an extent that as you're sweating, you notice your sweat is red and drops of blood are falling to the ground. This was the first time Jesus shed his blood. He did it for you. 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 And Jesus shed blood like drops of sweat from his brow because of the agony he felt in the garden shortly before he was about to be betrayed by one of his much-loved disciples. He loved Judas. He loved him. And Jesus was sent to the earth to redeem humanity. To buy us back from the power of sin. To buy us back from the power of the curse. To buy us out of the curse so that we can be blessed again. Jesus was sent to the earth to redeem humanity. And he remained faithful to the will of the Father until he had successfully completed his mission. Remaining faithful, and I want you all to look at me and I want you to listen. Remaining faithful is not always easy. I, I want you just to think about Jesus. He's there in the garden and he now has a choice. I can go down this road and there's the cross and there's immense suffering. But not only is it the physical suffering, all the sin of all of mankind is going to come upon me. Or I can go this road. And I can avoid this whole thing. All I have to do is walk out the garden. But Jesus remained faithful. And you know what happens? I can exchange his faithfulness for my unfaithfulness. The Lord experienced his greatest agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he conquered our redemption because it's there he said, I'm going to conquer. In Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 it says, He went on a little farther and bowed his face to the ground and said, My father, if it is possible, now he's praying this, guys, picture this. He's sweating blood. Blood is pouring out of his, 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 his forehead. He says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I want your will to be done, not mine. I want, wow, I want your will to be done, not mine. Tell birds next you say, wow. Jesus was faithful in everything. I want to tell you that the curse came in the Garden of Eden. And Adam said, I want my will to be done. Mine. I want to eat this fruit. I want my will to be done. Not God's will. And God said to him, no problem. By the sweat of your face, you will eat the bread until you return to the ground. By the sweat of your face. 
And so that curse came to Adam, and all of us are descended from Adam and Eve. All of us received that curse the moment we were conceived. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread until you return to the ground. And that's why Jesus shed blood to redeem us from the curse. And I want to tell you, you have to realize, you have to understand where you are, what you've done, how messed up things are, how bad the curse is over you, how heavy it is on you. You have to realize that before you're going to have the desire to want to apply the blood of faithfulness. You have to realize that betrayal, that someone betrayed you and you can't get over it. You will not get over it because there's a spiritual aspect. There's a curse behind that thing that you're struggling. People are telling you it's just a mindset. It's not just a mindset. There's a spiritual curse over you from the time that you were betrayed. And so whether you're unfaithful or someone else has been unfaithful to you, that's when you apply the blood of faithfulness. Jesus shed his blood from his brow to heal us from betrayal and to set us free from every generational curse that is caused by disobedience. When we're unfaithful, we become disobedient. We apply the blood of Jesus, the, the blood of faithfulness, when we've been betrayed by a loved one. And I want you to look at me now. What loved one has betrayed you? Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a spouse. Husband or a wife. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it's a business partner. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. But who's betrayed you? Who's betrayed you? And this thing is an issue in your life. It's on your life. It's heavy on your life. Then you need to apply the blood of faithfulness. You apply it when there's a generational curse caused by disobedience that wants to dominate your life. You apply it when you're tempted by the occult. Many things that people call culture across the whole world are actually occultic, which means they're satanic. This thing dominates our life when we're guilty of idolatry, when we're worshiping something other than God. It's heavy on our lives when we're filled with rebellion. It's heavy on our lives in sickness. And when this generational curse wants to dominate our lives, we apply the blood of faithfulness. We apply, and I want you just to think about it. In your mind, picture it, the blood that was shed from the forehead of Jesus as he's kneeling there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. And what will Jesus do? What will the blood do? He gives you an exchange. He takes your unfaithfulness right now. He takes your unfaithfulness that you're doing right now. And he takes it back to that moment 2,000 years ago. There in the Garden of Gethsemane. And your unfaithfulness goes on him. He becomes your unfaithfulness. And then he takes his faithfulness. Father, your will be done, not mine. And he puts that onto you. It's called the great exchange. It's the greatest of exchanges. There's nothing like this exchange. It's the only way you get out of the curse. The only way to get out of the curse is by the blood of Jesus. You can pray, you can spray, you can pray, you can do whatever you want. You will never get out of the curse without the blood of Jesus. You cannot scream yourself in a prayer service out of the curse. It's only by the blood of Jesus. The devil isn't afraid of your prayers. The devil's not afraid of your muti. The devil's not afraid of your incense or your your traditions and when he 
does the exchange. He gives you a forgiving heart. You're suddenly able to forgive that person. And you know what happens the moment you forgive that person that betrayed you? You're set free. In that instant, you're set free. He gives you a heart that is completely free from hatred. How is your heart when it comes to being filled with hatred? He gives you a heart that is completely free of resentment. I said at the beginning of the sermon, resentment shows we're weak. It shows we're under a curse. Jesus supernaturally removes that resentment off you if with faith you will apply this blood. He gives your heart completely free of bitterness. I wonder how many of us sitting here today, we've got bitter hearts. We've had hard lives and we've got bitter hearts. And we we keep telling people, my life is so hard. And some of you have got habits. There's things that you do and you cannot stop doing them. And they're bad things and they're bad for you and you know that they're bad for you. And you cannot stop doing them. But you have bitterness because you've had a hard life and so many things have happened and you're actually operating under a curse and the curse has got you locked down and until the curse is broken you won't be able to stop doing that thing you don't want to do let me tell you something today many people go online and they're looking at porn and the reason that they're looking at porn is not even that they're making their decision. They feel terrible. They feel dirty. They don't want to do it, but they're under a curse. I can go into a lot of different things. And you've got to apply the blood of faithfulness. The thing about it, porn is all about you being fa- unfaithful to your spouse. And those of you that are think- single, you're doing porn. Don't say, it's okay, I'm not married yet. First of all, don't think that the porn will stop when you get married. It doesn't. And secondly, unfaithfulness to your spouse is determined by what you do over the whole of your life. If you sleep with someone and you haven't yet met your spouse, you've cheated on your spouse. It's a curse. And when you start realizing that, you realize your brokenness before God, then you begin to realize why you need the blood of Jesus. It's only when you see your sin full in the face that you begin to realize, why do I need the blood of Jesus? Because I have bitterness in my heart. And I have a desire for revenge. There's people I want to show them. I want to tell them. I want to get them. And we can come and we can act big stuff and make like, it doesn't matter to me, it matters. It matters, it's holding you down and it's crushing you. You receive a heart that is faithful and obedient to the Word of God. Let me tell you something, if you're obedient to the Word of God, you will be faithful to the people you love. And when you apply this blood, you get complete freedom from generational curses. Are you sitting out today and you know there's a curse because there's stuff that has happened down the generations of your family and now it's happening in your life? With this you can break it and get complete freedom. Why? Because Jesus was perfectly faithful. Jesus was a servant of God, Isaiah 42 verse 1 to 4. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant land beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. We're beyond the sea from where that prophecy was made. There's the whole African continent 
There's the Mediterranean Sea. There's the Suez Canal. There's the Gulf of Arabia. All of that is between us and where that promise was made and yet it's been fulfilled. Amen. Jesus was the ultimate servant. And he brought justice. He didn't falter. He didn't lose heart. And he's working on the earth and one day justice will prevail throughout the earth. There will be perfect justice throughout all the earth. In John chapter 3 verse 36 says this, And anyone who believes in God's Son, listen to this, anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but remains under God's angry judgment. What have you done with Jesus? Ask your neighbor, say, hey neighbor, what have you done with Jesus? I want you to listen to me. Our relationship with Jesus saves us. Please hear me on this. The world is under a curse. The world is always in trouble because the world is under a curse. And the world is under a curse until Jesus comes back. And the curse comes in Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14. This is where the curse comes from. Listen, are you, are you listening? Ask the person next to you, are you listening? How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. When Adam fell, he fell with the devil. All of these issues, and I want you to listen to what I'm telling you today. All of these issues, every single one of them, they come from the devil. And they come from the evil that is within your own heart. They come from there. We cannot blame anyone else for what's wrong. Adam listened to the devil. And we've been under the yoke of the devil ever since. And so when Adam fell, he fell with Lucifer. And it comes from, I will ascend. It's me. It's me. Oh, me. And that's how we live. We live for me. And the moment we live for me, we fall. His blood canceled the curse of the sweat of Adam's brow. That curse that Adam went under when he sinned in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Garden of Eden, sorry. When Jesus sweat the blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, that blood canceled the curse. And this is the blood of faithfulness which frees us from every generational curse. Adam and Jesus, and I want you to listen very carefully today. Because I really feel God wants to move in, in our lives. Adam and Jesus faced the same decision. Take note, active church. They faced the same decision. To do their own will or to live according to the Word of God. Their decisions had consequences. Adam in the Garden of Eden... He did his own will and the sin that oppresses the human race originated there. Jesus, he was faithful and redemption, the redemption of the human race originated there. Sin originates in the Garden of Eden. Redemption originates in the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam despised the cup of blessing that God had given him. Jesus chose to drink Imagine this is a cup. He chose to drink from the cup of the curse that was ours. Adam 
had the servant who prevailed against him. The serpent prevailed. The devil prevailed against him. The devil won against him. Jesus defeated the serpent. Adam defiled the earth with his sin. Climate change is not the problem. Sin is. Jesus blessed the earth through his blood. Adam lost every blessing. Jesus recovered every blessing. Adam ate the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Jesus ate the fruit of obedience. Jesus ate the fruit of obeying the Father. Adam caused men to be created from the dust and that they will return to the earth like dust. From dust you were born and to dust you will return. Jesus came with the Word of God and He was the Word of God and from the Word of God He had chosen to become man so that He could take our place and carry our punishment. Adam disappointed God. Jesus brought joy to the Father's heart. Do you sit here today and do you feel you've disappointed God? This moment we're about to go into is for you. It's for you. It's for you. When you feel you've disappointed God, it's for you. Because of Adam, the curse of poverty came. Because of Jesus, the blessing of prosperity came. Because of Adam, the curse of sickness came. Because of Jesus, the, the blessing of healing came. Because of Adam, the curse of death came. Because of Jesus, the blessing of life came. Because of Adam, the curse of shame came. Shame came. But Jesus caused the blessing of glory to come. I want to tell you, I don't care what your shame is. Jesus wants to bring His blessing upon your life. Today, each one of these curses are replaced with a blessing when we apply the blood of faithfulness. And I want to invite you now to pray. We're going to pray a prayer applying the blood of faithfulness. And if you've got shame or if you feel you're oppressed or if you cannot get over things where someone has betrayed you or if you cannot get over your own sins and your own regrets or whatever the issue may be, whatever God may have been speaking about to you today, we're going to have an opportunity right now to pray and I want you to close your eyes and here's what I want you to do if the Lord has spoken to you today about this great exchange and you want to exchange all of the stuff that comes from the world that comes from the devil that is demonic if you want to exchange your addictions if you want to exchange those things where people have betrayed you and you just cannot overcome it, whatever it may be, and you want to apply the blood of faithfulness, if you want to exchange those tragic deaths that may be happening in your family, and you want to pray this prayer with me, I'm going to ask you right now to stand. And I'm going to encourage you not to worry about what people around you think. Keep your eyes closed. And I want you to picture yourself there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I want you to picture yourself. You're there with Peter, James and John. And like Peter, James and John, Jesus asked you to pray for him. And you're looking at yourself, you're snoring. You've fallen fast asleep. You cannot even be faithful to pray with Jesus. And Jesus says, don't worry. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And I want you to see the sweat coming off the brow of Jesus. And I want you to see the drops of sweat 
thudding to the ground. You hear, Dwa! Dwa! Because as those drops of sweat hit the ground, it's significant. I want you to see yourself. You're cowering there in the garden with shame. You're cowering there under the oppression of a betrayal or betrayals that have happened to you. And you cannot overcome them. You're cowering because there's been unnatural deaths and other things going on in your family. And you look up and there's Jesus. And he tells you to get up and so you get up. And he says, touch my forehead and you touch his forehead. And his blood is on your hand. And he says, now put your hand on your head. And I want you to put your hand on your head. As if you've got the blood of Jesus on your hand and it's, it's coming onto your life right now. And it's rolling down. And it's transforming everything. And so now with that picture, we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I apply the blood that was shed from your brow in Gethsemane as my atomic weapon against all the power of betrayal that has touched my life and my family caused by people I've trusted. I declare that every demonic power that manifests as a result is destroyed in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. I declare that every generational curse is absorbed by the blood of Jesus and that I will enjoy your blessing from now on. Thank you that you bless me where I am. I want you to say that loud. Say thank you that you bless me where I am. Thank you for blessing my family for protecting my descendants from all harm. Thank you for blessing me abundantly, for defeating all my enemies, and for making me the head and not the tail, and for your word, which guides me every step I take. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want you to give the biggest shout of praise. Give the biggest roar of victory here. Come on, let out a raw victory active church. Amen. Amen. And then I want to ask you, everyone stand. Please, everyone standing now. And I'm going to ask, even though it's quite cramped, if you need to either give your life to Jesus or maybe after praying that prayer, you need to recommit your life to Jesus. Just come right here. Come stand in front of me right now. Just come and stand in front of me right now. We're going to pray with you. Just spread out over the whole of the floor so people can get in. Can we just give a big round of applause for those that are coming forward? Just take a step forward, all of you, so that everyone can get in. Come on, give them a big round of applause, Active Church. I just feel I need to ask them. There's, there's one or two others you need to come forward. So I just feel I need to ask that. Just come forward right now. This is not embarrassing. This is an incredible thing. Just come forward right now. Father, I just pray those people, you, that one or two people, whoever they are, I pray, Lord, that you just give them the courage of their conviction just to come forward. If you're in the overflow, just come, come into the main room here. If there's anyone in the overflow, just come into the main room and come and stand here. I'm just going to wait for 30 seconds. Father, as, as we wait, I'm just praying. 
that anyone that needs to come will just come. And we just pray, Lord, that you make this a holy moment. In Jesus' name. Can we give him a round of applause? That is very brave. That is very brave. It was you the Lord laid on my heart. Because I feel at peace now we can pray. Okay. We're going to pray. And I first want you just to put your right hand on your heart. I want you to see Jesus. And I want you to realize this place, this cramped space here, is an altar that sanctifies everything. And I want you to see Jesus at the cross right now. And He's saying, I'm redeeming you from the power of the world. I'm redeeming you from the power of darkness. And you're declaring, Lord, I don't want to live another day without you. I want to know that one day when it comes my time to pass on from this world, that I will not go into eternity alone. I will never be away from you again. You're declaring that today. You're saying that today. You're saying, Lord, that outstanding balance I have before you because of my sin is being washed away in Jesus' name. I'm being made brand new. The exchange of my sin and the righteousness of your son Jesus is taking place at the cross right now. And I want you to picture Jesus. He's standing before you right now. And the word declares that this same Jesus, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And right now, your sins are being destroyed at the cross. His blood is the shed price that He paid for the forgiveness of all of our sins. So now we're going to pray. We're all going to pray together, but I'm going to ask you to mean this prayer. Because Jesus is serious about you. Amen. Let's pray together. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent of everything I've done wrong. I renounce my life of sin and I accept your sacrifice. And I know that it was the price you paid for my redemption. And today, Lord, I ask that the blood of your wounded body would wash me of all my rebellion and all my sin that you would set me free from any sickness and pain. And Lord, I accept. I accept it, Lord, that my debt has been paid. There is now standing balance. You paid everything for me at the cross of Calvary. I accept it by your blood. I am justified. And you see me as I had never sinned. And that by your blood, I am sanctified. You have chosen me to serve you, and I'm willing to serve you. And so today, I open the door of my heart. I ask you to come in as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and for giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Join the Vault Youth Conference on the 16th to the 17th of June, 2023 at the Moraletta Church in Swanee. Register today on my3c.tv.